Welcome to session two of Afro-Latinx Poetry Now, brought to you by the Institute for Latino Studies and the Initiative on Race and Resilience, along with several other campus sponsors who are listed on the back of the program. You'll also find the sponsorship category, Private Benefactors. When we first conceived of this gathering, well over a year ago, we aspired to be able to pay our featured presenters a decent honorarium. In order to do that, we knew we'd need private money in addition to institutional sponsorship. Reading from the bottom of the program, reading from the bottom of the page on the back of the program, their names are David E. Cantor, Gary Hogel, and Barbara Lehman, Joe and Terry Sweeney, Ken Crocker, Ralph W. Yerick, Anonymous, Dennis and Donna O'Leary, Tom and Marion Roars, Joseph A. Powers Jr. and James R. Wilson. A number of these benefactors are in fact Notre Dame alums, including Joe, Dennis, Tom, and Joseph. But I want to make special mention of one benefactor, not an alum, but a friend who made the trip from Washington, D.C. to be with us in person. And that would be Jim Wilson, who is sitting among you right there, our pr private benefactor. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. What I want to do now is briefly introduce our second and third speaker. Hold on one moment. The Institute for Latino Studies has a wonderful custom at the beginning of every academic year of having what's called an opening of the year, I'm sorry, opening of the year, pachanga. And I got to meet our first speaker, Francisco Robles, at that pachanga a number of years ago. Although his area is not technically speaking poetics, he reads and has a lot to say about poetry. In fact, one of the first things we discovered was our mutual love for the work of John Murillo. When I decided that I wanted to bring scholars, I needed to ha find examples. I needed to find someone to help me select them. And Francisco was absolutely crucial in that regard. And three of the six scholars that we'll be hearing during these two days are directly a result of his curatorial acumen. On our final night together, I'm sorry. And our, our second speaker, who you'll be hearing from after Francisco reads, is someone who I've known or first encountered over 10 years ago. In the fall of 2010, I had the pleasure of being in community with seven other Latinx poets who also distinguished themselves as editors. In fact, tomorrow's headliner was one of them. We gathered and were in, in residence for a week at the Ragdale Foundation in Lake Forest, Illinois. On our final night together, we gave a public reading. And in the audience, a modest one for sure, was a tallish, slim young man I did not recognize. In fact, and I'll ask him to corroborate this, I don't think a word was exchanged between us. Only later did I realize and learn that said man was a brand new assistant professor at Northwestern University, one who specialized in, among other things, Latinx poetry. It wouldn't be until the summer of 2018 at the Latino Studies Association Conference in Washington, DC, that I would have the pleasure of breaking bread with John Alba Cutler, whose distinguished bio you can read in the program. For example, John is currently in his second year as an associate professor of English at my alma mater, UC Berkeley. But for now, please welcome to the podium our first speaker, Francisco Robles. All right. Um, one of the things I'm particularly glad about in the title of this talk is that you literally use the words uh, sound and sense, and sense and sound, uh, in your own talk about Aricelis Kirmai. 
Um, I feel incredibly lucky that that resonance <laughs> came through. So um, let me start by doing the thing I never remember how to do, which is how to start the slideshow. Thank you so much. <laughs> so thank you to everyone for being here and for sharing this space here at Notre Dame and virtually. Thank you to our poets for being here. Your presence honors us. And I'm deeply inspired by you all and your work. Thank you uh, to Brett Amenedo and Brittany Blackburn and Amber Kirk. And finally, thank you to Francisco Aragon for your vision and your care especially in ensuring that this conversation can take as many shapes and directions as there are voices in the room. So before I begin today's poem, I want to read one, uh, today's paper, uh, Wishful Thinking. I want to read uh, one of Yesenia Montilla's poems from her forthcoming book, Muse Found in a Colonized Body. And thanks to Yesenia, Francisco Aragon, and Four Way Books Press, the collection is in my hands. <laughs> it's very beautiful. <laughs> the poem is called A Poem with Birds in It. The universe has many mysteries, and we being each our own universe, we are full of blossoms. The oak tree's secret song, the mycelium network, like a million silkworm threads swinging underfoot. There is a cleaning the body does, if you have a good healer. There's a reverie in being, when you have a good teacher. There's a bounty in fully living, please believe me, the earth begs us to call it our lover, and our body its house, and our mouth its nightingale. If you sit super still during the summer solstice, you'll see a thousand flocks take flight into the dusty sky. It will sound like a humming caught in the throat. It will feel like a needle strumming. It will vibrate everything, and just when you think you do not deserve such beauty, you'll grow wings. So I begin with this poem as an invocation, as an index of implied loss on an ecological scale, but also of the blossoms and wings that we as humans might gain if we recall that we are each our own universe. Once you read it for yourself, you'll see that the poem has no punctuation, other than apostrophes for possession and the contraction of words, that is. It has no punctuation besides an M dash in the final line. Mm. This insistence on openness, affected by the poem's refusing of closure and defying of enclosure, encapsulates much of the collection's overarching semiotic flow. It's a book of learning through unlearning, of transformative selfhood as an active relationship between past, present, and future, of insistent presence and aliveness. Or if I could borrow Jesenia's own words about Aristides Kirmay, it's uh, fluid, inclusive, and courageous. Given that remember is one of the most important and repeated verbs from Montilla's wonderful first collection, The Pink Box, the move towards sh the shaping of memory through the grammatical present and muse found in a colonized body rethinks and rescales the vulnerability of sharing one's memories. The latter collection does this by inviting the reader into the shared space of memorial presence rather than creating memories that can be accessed by the reader through the poetic recollection of past experiences. Although I perhaps hinted at a difference of kind between the two collections, I want to be clear. Both collections serve as vessels of vulnerability, and both of them bear witness. The difference is felt through their scales of grief. The pink box embeds us in personal and hemispheric history. Muse found in a colonized body embeds us too. Though the scale is much smaller, mycelium networks that undergird forests, acorns on the ground, bodies in a bed, but it also expands beyond the global, noting at one point that there are uncountably more solar systems than there are humans. In making this distinction of scale, I turn to an ancient yet somehow still emergent poetic mode, lamentation. Lamentation constitutes an aesthetic and effective mode of registering grief that exceeds indexing. The relational language of lamentation carves out a shared sense of grief and outrage, folding together atomistic and world historical scales of apostrophic address, that is poetic language that directly addresses someone outside of the poem speaker. Lamentation is an aesthetic mode that exceeds the self as an isolated unit of individual grief 
It is relational and it is public. It's a mode that calls forth, putting into words and feelings those who are no longer with us. This means making visible loss, not in order to fetishize it, but to bring it to life, no matter how briefly. To give a very specific example of what I mean, I'll turn extensively to Jesenia Montilla's poem, Maps, from Muse Found in a Colonized Body. The interplay of the I and the you in Montilla's poetry in particular functions to establish limitations, paradoxically personal and planetary scope. So Maps begins with a subtly minimizing gesture, undermining the analogical tendency of Maps to function as representational models that scale the world down to a noble image, an apprehensible form. But Montilla starts off by pointing out, by pointing to the non-universalism of maps. Some maps have blue borders, like the blue of your name, or the tributary lacing of veins running through your father's hands. And how the last time I saw you, you held me for so long, I saw whole lifetimes flooding by me, small tentacles reaching for both our faces. I wish, and I'm cutting off the line there, sorry, uh, or I'm cutting off the movement of the lines. Some maps, she, tell us, she tells us, have blue borders that are immediately converted into an image for the tributary lacing of veins running through your father's hands. The blue of your name, Montilla told me, uh, because I thought it meant something else, and, uh, well, anyhow, that's a different story. The blue of your name um, is the double blue of Marcelo, Mar and Celo, or Cielo. The rapid shift of simile from maps to the blue of your name, from description to the lyric address that then competes to become the subject of the sentence, produces a wonderful confusion of lyric speech. In this sense, Montilla's poetry perhaps offers a model of what Michael Dowdy elsewhere calls infra-poetics, which he theorizes through a poet, Mauricio Kilwain Guevara, whose infra-poetics uses and praises approximate subject positions and spaces of dispossession through what he notes are formal tonal unpredictability and variability. As an example of this potential infra-poetics, Montilla's poem demonstrates a gradual shift from direct address to the you to the unfurling, almost unstoppable expansion of metaphor, the small tentacles reaching for both our faces, continues the semiotic connection to the blue of the sea, but does so in a manner that completely changes the scale and scope of this poetic imagination. Generally, what I'm pointing to is the unsettling of metaphor in these lines, such that the concept of the lyrical imagination gets redistributed in purposely estranging ways. I'll continue. This is how it goes on. I wish maps would be without borders and that we belong to no one and everyone at once. What a world that would be, or not a world. The wish here for maps to be without borders is a return to the revision of the first line, intensifying the blue borders that remind the poem speaker of Marcelo's name. Yet there was no imaginative destruction of the world or the poem's addressee. And in Muse found in a colonized body as a whole, there's a distinctive love for the world. However, the idea of sovereignty as belonging within a body public of some sort is purposely made contradictory here. The lyric speaker wishes that we belonged to no one and everyone at once. Not sequentially, but simultaneously, at once. This is such a contradictory image that the poem pursues it through yet another contradiction. What a world that would be, or not a world. The poem holds that contradiction in enjammed suspense before suggesting what not a world could be. Or not a world, maybe we could call it something more intrinsic, like forgiving, or something simplistic, like rivers or dirt. Maybe does the same work here that some does at the poem's opening. It refuses closure, suggesting possibilities rather than certainties. The options we read are intrinsic or simplistic, a dyad I don't actually know what to do with yet. Intrinsic offers a quality, forgiving, whereas simplistic offers other categories of being altogether. Rivers or dirt are wonderful things too. Rivers inherently change, uh, they're inherently changing forms of the same. Every water molecule moves even as the body of water remains the same, and dirt, as Desert Studies has shown us over and over again, dirt forms a worldwide interchange of nutrients and chemicals that keep that world growing and healing. I'm gonna to skip to the end of the poem now and focus on the final stanza of 14 lines. It's as though the poem stanza split occurs so that the conclusion can form a sonnet, one that returns us to the image of the globe after having transformed it throughout the poem. 
And what is a map but the delusion of safety? The line drawn is always in the sand and folds on itself before we're done making it. And that line there, south of El Rio, how it dares to cover up the bodies as though we would forget who died there and for what? As if we could forget that if you spin a globe and stop it with your finger, you'll land it on top of someone living, someone who was not expecting to be crushed by thirst. This is a map that, at least initially, provides enclosure separation and value generated through possession. But the speaker calls bullshit. I'm the other one who's gonna do it, sorry, John. <laughs> um, the speaker calls bullshit, noting that the line there dares to cover up the bodies as though we would forget who died. Thus calling out the violence that so often determines sovereignty scope. This condemnation makes the point that the logic of drawing the map's boundaries is willfully violent. It's never natural. As though and as if point out just how unnatural maps are in their representation via analogy. And the phrases do this by pointing out what cannot be forgotten. Even if the globe is just a representation of the world, not the world itself, that is, the poem continues its unsettling argument by stating that if you stop it with your finger, you'll land it on top of someone living. I want to be clear, unsettling is a good thing a word that functions as both adjective and verb and that points to the decolonial work Montilla's poetry is doing. And I'm gonna jump ahead uh, and quickly say that uh, Montilla's poetry is very resonant with Muriel Rookeiser's, um, especially the not forgetting. So I have some lines from the final section of her long poem, The Book of the Dead, that I'm just gonna skip through. I'll give you a chance to read it and then I'll skip ahead, so qu read quickly. <laughs> and then also, before I knew that you were gonna be speaking on Aristides Girmay, this is a connection I think is really thorough, actually. So just some poems from Arroz Poetica. Uh, Girmay's really wonderful, really disturbing Ars Poetica poem that begins <laughs> uh, her first collection, Teeth. It's extraordinary that she begins with this announcement. Um, that's all I'll say, okay. Um, I'm gonna skip several pages. So. Because I don't think I have much time, I'm gonna move quickly through some observations on three more poems. The first is Searching for My Own Body. The unsettling movement of metaphor in this poem spans several images and imaginative scopes. It begins, my body is a small cave door. It's a slick whale, a jubilant sea of tall grass that sways and makes its way across countries and lovers I love Love making. Ren Ellis Neda notes that poetry such as this operates through a poetics of besideness on maroon grounds, constituted by defiant sonic ruptures of sense, and attentive to the differences of how things get together, yet remain broken. Searching for my own body breaks open the logic of extension and relation, and in Neda's words, is attentive to the differences of how things get together. The body is, a cave door, a slick whale, a jubilant sea of tall grass that moves from country to country, from lover to lover. The shape-shifting body goes from geological phenomenon to seafaring mammal to world-spanning flora. And I think actually Montilla's own description of Girimai's poetry, that it's poetry bursting with possibilities, names precisely what this really intriguing metaphorical movement is doing. It's perhaps a uh, fluidity that works through disjuncture, not to sort of push against this idea, but I think as some scholars like uh, Marisa Moreno or Yamare Figueroa have shown, disjuncture only names what we can't name yet. It's in fact fluidity of another sort, of another order. And I think that's what precisely what this metaphorical movement is doing. So of course, other poets move from image to image in intriguing associative leaps. Surrealists, for example, make an entire movement out of breaking down the logic of linguistic connection. But what distinguishes Montilla's unsettling metaphorical movement is her poetry's insistently planetary scope, especially in terms of ecological groundedness. It's not the dream language of surrealism or the propulsive logic of objectivist poetry either. It shares an affinity with the ecologically anchored imaginations of W.S. Merwin's poems of watching silent animals, celestial bodies and plants that know what you're doing or Aristeles Girmay's rivers and seas, full with life and death, memory and conversation, connection above all. 
It's the operation of metaphor as a figuration of linguistic transport, moving a thought from one idea or image to another image, and does this against stability. Or, as Marisol Moreno might put it, it's a rejection of insularity in favor of archipelagic thinking. The archipelago it's, is many. It is relation. For Yomaira Figueroa Vasquez, relation generates a synthesis of precision and capaciousness necessary for, quote, reckoning with a long array of our histories as well as a commitment to seeing relations and disjunctures across the Black Atlantic and across the world. A flexible yet coherent concept, relation reorients thought according to interpretive protocols that destabilize the criteria that literary studies has long upheld as indicative of influence and importance. Thus, relation privileges movement over stability, embeddedness over radical individuation, and connection over distinction. We may consider what this concept means for artistic practices, especially since, as Edouard Glissant argues, relation is learning more and more to go beyond judgments into the unexpected dark of art's upsurgings. Its beauty springs from the stable and the unstable, from the deviance of many particular poetics and the clairvoyance of a relational poetics. Considering Figueroa Vasquez and Glissant together, relation is both ever reinventing and historically embedded. Relation is ever in motion. It's unsatisfied with the ossification of social forms. And it consistently offers disjunctures, upsurgings, and deviance, and fluidity, I would add. Glissant's words resonate with Montilla's unsettling metaphorical movements, sliding as they do through images with disjunctive, fluid, upsurging ease. Montilla's move from, a from the body as a small cave door to a slick whale to a sea of tall grass to the declaration, I love lovemaking, offers us an archipelagic approach to the erotic body. And I haven't touched on this much today, but Muse Found in a Colonized Body is a very sensual book with ample imagery of masturbation, of lovemaking, of passion. It's a book full of actualization and longing. This sensibility gets at the point that the great writer Mayra Santos Febres makes in her essay, Los Uses del Eros, in El Caribe, that a discursive and experiential reconceptualization of the body in Caribbean literature is needed, especially in light of the hypersexualized and racialized tradition pervaded by white authors. Santos Febres argues that, um, I'll read it in Spanish. Uh, this, is, this hasn't been translated yet, but it's available in a collection called uh, Sobre Piel y Papel. So, la presencia del cuerpo en la literatura caribeña suele señalar hacia otro espacio de contención y negociación literaria, la que define al cuerpo como la frontera entre lo social y lo íntimo. And she continues, noting that this new vision of writing about and through the body means understanding that la existencia de dos tipos de conocimiento existe. El conocimiento interno, íntimo, y el conocimiento de cómo el poder social actúa sobre la existencia misma de ese cuerpo. El enfrentamiento entre el cuerpo y la página. Su materialidad expresada en los dos lenguajes de lo erótico y de lo orgánico. Actúan como un puente que conecta al cuerpo con la memoria y con la historia silenciada en el Caribe. Montilla's poetry, producing an enmeshment of the body and textual representation, the body and the page in Santos Febres' words, creates a semantic bridge whose map is made up of erotic and organic language. Uh, searching for my own body gives us love poetry of an intriguing new order. I'm gonna skip ahead now. I love this poem, but I'm not gonna talk about it. Okay. Um, the collection ends with a poem, Muse Found in Magical Realism. And I'm going to focus on the poem's first stanza and its last stanza. The first thinks of magical realism as a mode of transforming the world, a process that, the poem warns, can cause problems. She was born with lace gloves on. It was a miracle. Her hands were light, and everything she touched turned to something else. By the time you get to the final stanza, this process has become cumbersome. Yet rather than disavowing transformation altogether, the poem makes its final gesture. Towards the end, she took off the gloves to feel the world and it turned into a pile of clovers. Having lost everything, she touched her own body and became cattle. She ate the world, ate it all. The world, converted to clover, 
feeds the transformed poet. As cattle, she ate the world, ate it all. This is a final, grammatically and imaginatively unsettling image. Cattle is plural, an uncountable noun that denotes plurality. She, of course, is singular, or actually maybe not singular, but whatever, grammatically, she is singular. To be in the world, the poem suggests, is to encounter it transformatively, and also to be transformed in that very encounter between the self and the world. The muse of the title, which is found in a colonized body, gets surprised by and in the body. And I mean surprised here like early modernists do. Not only to be shocked, but to be overtaken. The muse was present in the body to begin with, but it's also part of that body. And like the muses in Teresa Hak Kyung Cha's dictate, Montilla's muse helps the poet approach history, family, and the self in, finally, a decolonial, upsurging manner. The muse is one and many, just as her own body became cattle. And the world is now clover, sustaining, green. I find the final image sweet and placid. Cattle move so slowly as they eat. They bump into each other. They think what they think as they wend their way through fields. If the poem's been lost, and if the world's been lost, there's a way to regain it, slowly, meaningfully, by putting our faces in the clover and knowing that it can sustain us. Thus, finally, the muse can be found in a decolonized body. Thank you. Grateful. I want to begin by expressing thanks to Francisco for um, organizing this uh, incredible symposium and inviting me to be a, a part of it. Um, I'm also grateful to uh, Brent Amanito and uh, Maribel Rodriguez for helping uh, me at various points with logistics and uh, to all of the scholars and, and poets who are here for uh, allowing me to be a part of your company and, and learn from your work. Um, is this, uh, let's see, this is up here. So let me. Go in here. I want to start with uh, a question. These are very simple slides. You, you'll, you will not be impressed by my technological savvy. I guarantee that. What does it mean to read John Murillo as an Afro Latinx poet? Our first impulse might be to focus on uh, his published poems that have obvious or recognizable Latinx, Latino, Chicano signifiers. In Santayana, the muralist, for example, which is from Murillo's first book, Up Jump the Boogie, uh, Murillo pays homage to an elderly Los Angeles muralist who aerosols Aslan across Barrio Brick for all the poor to see Aztec warriors, old Mexican wash women, Dios del Sol. Monster Boy, a narrative prose poem from the same book um, that has uncanny echoes, I think, of Juno Diaz's short story, Israel, describes a childhood prank done with the hopes of getting Psycho Michael Lopez out of the way so Dolores Luna and I could fall in love. <laughs> and uh, uh, the prank, the prank uh, backfires, I'll just say. You gotta read the poem. And of course, the name Dolores occurs again in the poem Dolores Maybe uh, from Murillo's most recent book, Contemporary American Poetry, which narrates a young girl's death by suicide in the wake of being sexually abused by her father uh, in Ontario, California. The speaker of this poem is a young man who witnesses the events at a distance, remembering so little of the girl that he cannot even recall her name. Let's call her Dolores, he says, from dolor, Spanish for anguish. 
Each of these poems has features of what we would conventionally recognize as Latino, Latinx poetry, including references to the history and politics of the Chicano movement, Spanish language uh, and English code switching, and attention to the experiences and spaces of Mexican, uh, Mexican racialization in California. So one way of approaching Murillo uh, as, uh, uh, under the auspices of a symposium like this on Afro-Latinx poetry would thus be to claim him as an Afro-Latinx poet and surely one of the most accomplished and urgent uh, Afro-Latinx poets working today. So as I was reading and writing and working on this talk, I confess to some discomfort with this mode of reading um, that I, I want to explain now. Uh, we are writing a wave of critiques within uh, Latinx studies. Uh, and I should, and I want to be clear, rightful critiques for the way that uh, Latinidad has marginalized and erased blackness. Um, I thought Daryl in the first uh, session did a, a really, had a beautiful articulation of this in that the trope of mestizaje weaponizes Latinidad to erase blackness. I thought that was a, a powerful um, articulation of that. What I uh, have become uncomfortable with is the way the response to these critiques in um, some corners, scholarly um, circles that I have seen. Uh, and surely one important response to charges of inclusion is to include, to widen the umbrella and increase the scope of Latinidad. But the problem as I see it comes when this adjustment happens by repeatedly recentering Latinidad. The very term Afro-Latinx installs such a gesture within it, making Afro an adjective modifying the substantive Latinx. What begins as inclusion can sometimes end by reaffirming subordination. So I want to resist that trap as much as possible today, which is why I've chosen to focus my remarks on one of Murillo's poems that does not read, obviously, as Latinx, and that may offer a different uh, complementary way of imagining the relationship of blackness to Latinidad in the United States. The poem is uh, a refusal to mourn the deaths by gunfire of three men in Brooklyn, a heroic crown of sonnets that sits at the center of Murillo's powerhouse second book, Contemporary American Poetry. Uh, as the form of the heroic crown demands, this will be on the quiz later, uh, the poem unfolds in the form of 15 linked sonnets. Uh, uh, the, and it describes the feelings of the speaker in the aftermath of the 2014 murder of two Brooklyn police officers by a black man, apparently in retaliation for police violence against black people. A refusal to mourn asks its readers to dwell in the uncomfortable space of its speaker's desire for violent retribution against the state, linking the 2014 case to earlier instances of black rebellion, most notably the 1992 Los Angeles uprising. As a provocation, the poem most powerfully challenges liberal reformist politics, and especially as they appear in the poetry world. So the first part of my talk will examine the nature of that challenge. In the second part of my talk, I'll consider how we might extend that challenge to consider Latinx black poetics, not through subsumption and incorporation, but rather through the lived realities of proximity and entanglement and solidarity. So as with any poem, a good place to begin is with the title, A Refusal to Mourn the Deaths by Gunfire of Three Men in Brooklyn. Murillo alludes to Dylan Thomas's famous poem, A Refusal to Mourn the Death by Fire of a Child in London. And I think it's instructive to compare the nature of refusal in each of these poems. Dylan Thomas's poem famously celebrates the cycles of death and rebirth that govern the natural world the seasons and cycles of sowing and harvesting become symbols of a transcendent pattern of death and rebirth for humans. There is no need in Thomas's poem to lament or mourn the accidental death of the child because it is merely part of this cycle. Murillo's poem refuses mourning on very different grounds. 
If one of the primary meanings of mourning is to show customary signs of grief for a death, then what's being refused in Murillo's poem is the way that death can be greeted in a, uh, customarily, right? Through rituals, through um, becoming accustomed to it, to the fact of it. Uh, to mourn means to repeat or reenact prescripted rituals or gestures of grief. And when it comes to high profile cases of violence, um, such as state violence against black people or black uprisings in response to state violence, the public rituals of mourning have become all too familiar. Thoughts and prayers, condemnations of uh, violence, promises of investigation. When the speaker of Murillo's poem declares that he wants a brick, a window, one good match to watch it bloom, the threat of violence upsets these familiar rituals. He wants retribution, not mourning. There's another meaning of mourning um, that comes from the psychoanalytic tradition. Uh, Freud writes in Mourning and Melancholia that to mourn is to grieve the loss of an object of desire for an appropriate amount of time and then to find a new object and move on. Those who persist in grieving or dwelling on the loss can be understood as pathological in their attachments or in Freud's terms, uh, melancholic. Even more than the first sense of mourning, Murillo's poem refuses this second sense. It refuses to let go of its attachment. Reviewers have commented on the poem's unsettling anger, and we'll get there today, but I think it's crucial to understand the force of its attachment first to understand the intensity of its rage. To see this, we can attend to a, peculiar, a peculiarity in the form of the poem. I shouldn't write words that I can't say out loud. <laughs> peculiarity in the form of the poem. A place where Murillo disrupts the threaded repetition that constitutes the heroic crown of sonnets. So normally, a crown of sonnets works by repeating the last line of a, of a given sonnet as the first line of the following sonnet. In uh, A Refusal to Mourn, Murillo, um, uh, he kind of modifies that form by repeating the first line of each sonnet as the last line of the subsequent sonnet. So that the line, uh, as when you encounter it the second time, it's sort of a belated echo uh, of the first time. As with the heroic, uh, in the conventional heroic crown, the 15th sonnet comprises all of the repeated lines from the previous 14 sonnets. And in uh, a refusal to mourn, the lines mostly echo each other really closely. You can track the form, and there's that, that satisfaction if you know the form of kind of seeing it lock into place. So here's an example. You change the channel and it's him again becomes in the, in the uh, last line of the subsequent sonnet. You change the channel, fuck, it's him again, and so on. But early in the poem, there are a few lines that don't repeat as obviously, that troubled the pattern, trouble the patterned unfolding of the heroic crown. The first line of the second sonnet reads, to breathe it in, this boulevard perfume, and should, according to the formal logic of the poem, be repeated as the last line of the third sonnet. But instead, what we get, it, what we get is, uh, and why feel shame? Is it the dream or that it's only a dream? So these lines stand out to me for how faint, almost undetectable the repetition is. But this frustrated repetition also conveys the clearest sense of the, the attachment that the poem refuses to let go. So here's the beginning of the second sonnet. To breathe it in, this boulevard perfume, beauty shop of beauty shops and roadie shacks, to take in all its funk, calypso, reggaeton, and soul, to watch school kids and elders go about their days, their living, is, if not to fall in love, at least to wonder why some want us dead. Again this week, they killed another child who looked like me. A child will march about, who will, who will grace our placards, say, then be forgotten like a trampled pamphlet. The first seven lines of the sonnet constitute a single sentence with multiple grammatical subjects. To breathe in the boulevard perfume, to take in its funk, to watch the kids and elders go. And a single predicate, to do all these things is to fall in love. Or if not that, at least to be confounded by the hatred of others. 
How could the beauty of such an existence inspire hatred? The final three lines seal this anxious, uh, excuse me, not three lines, the final uh, five or six lines, seal this anxious bewilderment with three sejuras that first link living and love through their consonants and then undo them with the opposition of dead, right? <clears throat> the speaker strengthens the attachment with this sense of personal identification, the child who looks like him. And already the poem begins to meditate on the uselessness of mourning as a response to the child so soon forgotten and discarded. The second sonnet uh, in the second half of it goes on to oppose the lyrical unfolding of the beauty of black life in the first half with a stuttering half articulation of desire for violent retribution in the second half. What I want, I'm not supposed to, payback. Woe and plenty trouble for the gunman's clan. I'm not supposed to, but I want a brick, a window, one good match to watch it bloom. These last seven lines start and stop in short clipped sentence fragments as the speaker tries to express the rage he feels at contemplating the death of yet another child who looked like me. The sentence fragments convey the difficulty of even expressing the desire for violence. They not only separate out, the, separate out the objects from the predicate, payback and woe, but they even separate the subject and predicate from each other. What I want, I'm not supposed to. In other words, I'm not supposed to want what I want. So I want to make two connections between this vision of the poet's attachment, violently interrupted, and then the third sonnet, uh, which begins to unfold more expansively the possibility of retribution and revolution. First, it's notable that this third sonnet is spoken in the second person, an anaphoric catalog of sentences beginning with, you dream. Just at the moment when the speaker has difficulty articulating his own violent desires, the second person introduces a kind of dissociation as if he's talking to himself. That dissociation comes to a head at the end of the sonnet. You, do, you dream of pistol smoke and bacon, folded flags, and why feel shame? Is it the dream or that it's only a dream? Just as the speaker can't quite articulate his violent desire in the second sonnet, here, he can't quite locate the nature of his shame, whether it results from having violent fantasies of revenge or from failing to make those fantasies reality. The second connection, uh, to go back to the, the form of the heroic crown, is the loose echo of perfume with dream. There are two ways of understanding, I think, well, at least two ways, how these lines resonate with each other. One is in the, the olfactory images, the scent of perfume in the first line of sonnet two is echoed in the scent of pistol smoke and bacon that is cooked pig in the penultimate line of the second sonnet. And then there's the sonic likeness of perfume and dream, the near rhyme of the vowels and the shared M sound. This confluence of sound and sense might suggest that the description of a vibrant, thriving community is itself a kind of dream. And of course, we all know what happens to a dream deferred. By choosing to remain attached, a refusal to mourn asks us to consider whether mourning in the customary ways dehumanizes the victims of state violence. The piece with this stance is the poem's skeptical attitude toward poetry as a toothless response to oppression, typical of quietist reformist politics. In the ninth sonnet of The Crown, the speaker describes the police Watching a, poetry uh, watching a poetry reading in protest, amused as when a mastiff meets a yapping lapdog. The simile vividly dramatizes the power differential between the police and the poets. The speaker is ashamed of himself for dreaming only, and that shame is amplified by the comparison to a lapdog. The police watch the poets protest the way a king might watch a circus clown produce a pistol from a passing car our wrath, the flag that reads, kaboom. Our art, a Malcolm poster rolled up, raised to swat. And these metaphors all point at the difference between merely symbolic and material action, between poets who declaim and a single black man who takes action. A, poet, a poem might read kaboom, but it doesn't make anything explode. The fact that this critique happens within a poem 
for me, only amplifies the discomfort. If the speaker finds this a pointless pro project, what are we to think as readers? We're left squirming, denied even the small comfort of congratulating ourselves for having read a poem as a sign of our political solidarity. So there's much more to be said uh, on this point and on this poem, but I want to turn uh, back in the time that remains to the question of how the unsettling challenges of a refusal to mourn, the challenges that it poses to any reader, might offer an opportunity to think Latinx black poetics differently. I use the word unsettling advisedly and I'm happy that I'm, I'm also echoing um, Francisco's use of it in, in uh, the talk that he just gave. Following on uh, uh, the scholar Anna Brickhouse's uh, work to suggest both the unsettling of mind by anxiety, worry, fear, and anger, and in a more literal sense, the unsettlement or undoing of colonial projects. We're left squirming as readers of a refusal to mourn, but especially as Latinx readers, are we unsettled? As I mentioned earlier, A Refusal to Mourn is not one of Murillo's most obviously uh, Latino poems. It is rather a very black poem. As Murillo explains in the notes to the volume, the poem is partly a response to the killing of two NYPD officers and subsequent suicide of Ismail Brinsley in December 2014, reportedly motivated by the rash of police killings and of unarmed black people nationwide. Um, as it takes up arguably the most volatile site of 21st century US racial conflict, the poem reflects back on previous moments of black rebellion, uh, as I said, notably the 1992 LA uprising. And internally, the, the poem's universe of references includes black historical figures, Huey P. Newton and Malcolm X, uh, who represent for the speaker of the poem the apex of black militancy. And in addition, each of the sonnets is preceded, as you can see, by an epigraph from another black poet, um, and it's you know, a veritable kind of who's who of, of contemporary black poetry um, from Tim Sables to Terrence Hayes to Bob Kaufman to, as you see here, Indigo Moore and Amiri Baraka. Beyond uh, the single mention that we saw of reggaeton in the second sonnet, the poem has no obvious Latinx content. It's nothing to suggest that we should read the voice of the poem as Latino or Afro-Latino and not just black. There's nothing to suggest that this speaker, in other words, should be subsumed or incorporated into Afro-Latinidad, but that doesn't mean that the poem does not exist in proximity or in urgent relation to Latinidad. And there are two obvious ways, I think, that we might imagine this urgent relationship, if not in the content of the poem, then in the historical context that provides the poem's grounds. I'm quoting again from Murillo's notes at the end of the volume, and I've been coy about introducing this context up to this point, I hope for reasons that will become apparent. On December, 20, on December 20th, 2014, Ismail Brinsley shot and killed Brooklyn officers Rafael Ramos and Wenjian Liu before fleeing the scene and ultimately shooting himself dead on a subway platform. The poem itself never mentions Ramos or Liu by name and certainly never implies that Ramos's Latinidad was complicit with the ongoing police violence that led to Brinsley's actions that day. But maybe we can speculate for a moment about the possible significance of Ramos's Latinidad to us. What does it mean that this act of violence resulted in the deaths not of two white police officers, but rather a Latino and an Asian American police officers? Does it unsettle us? What do these dynamics suggest, if anything, about the differential racialization of Latinos, Latinas, Latinx. We see some troubling dynamics at work in the media coverage of the killings, as you might not be surprised to hear. According to a New York Times profile, Ramos, a Latino police officer from Queens, joined the NYPD less than three years before the shooting. He was older than most recruits, having attended seminary with the intent of becoming a police chaplain, then worked as a delivery driver for um, DHL for a decade. He was beloved by his neighbors, and in the profile's most earnest sentence, we learned that he bought ham and cheese sandwiches at the corner deli, made trips to the laundromat, and talked to his boys in Spanish about basketball. In sum, Officer Ramos was a person, desiring and speaking and loved and lo loving and loved. And the profile gives the same glowing attention to Officer Liu, who's depicted as leaving many friends and acquaintances um, and working to rise up from his family's humble immigrant background. 
Meanwhile, the story mentions Brinsley only once, referring to him as a gunman and offering no context or explanation for uh, the murders. The Times profile is a good example of what Judith Butler describes in another context as a refusal of discourse that produces dehumanization. This is distinct for Butler from dehumanizing discourse or discourse that has active harmful content to it. The Times doesn't portray Brinsley harmfully, it just refuses to portray him at all. But precisely that nothing in comparison with the loving attention paid to Ramos and Liu implies that Brinsley is a non-entity. To quote again from Butler, if there were to be an obituary, there would have had to be a life worth noting, a life worth valuing and preserving, a life that qualifies for recognition. All of these are the qualities of what Butler famously describes as grievable, or we might say mournable lives. The Times coverage clearly suggests which lives in the 2014 case were grievable and which was not. What does Ramos's Latinidad have to do with this? On the one hand, we might object that it's mere hap happenstance. In a trenchant critique, Tatiana Flores argues that anti-black racism is ubiquitous in Latin America and commonplace in Latinx communities, even those with Afro-descendant roots. But Officer Ramos's racism, or lack thereof, isn't the issue either in the Times coverage or Murillo's poem. On the other hand, it would be naive to ignore the way the Times participates in a version of racial triangulation that pits deserving, upwardly mobile, or striving immigrants against the specter of violent blackness. Part of what, part of what makes Ramos and Liu grievable, in other words, is that the value of their lives comes from a familiar story that reaffirms the essential goodness of America. To grieve is to mourn. And in this respect, it's important to remember the full title of Murillo's poem, A Refusal to Mourn the Deaths by Gunfire of Three Men in Brooklyn. Most of the poem's thematic interest is in the possibility of retributive violence. And it would be easy to misread the poem as merely a celebration of that violence and therefore a refusal to mourn the deaths of Ramos and Liu. Several of the reviews of Murillo's book read it in precisely this way as a commentary on the deaths of the police officers. Uh, and I, I have some examples, but I'm, I'm not going to cite them here. But it's not, the poem isn't a refusal to mourn two deaths, the deaths of the police officers. It's a refusal to mourn three deaths. The poem refuses to participate in the dehumanization that happens when only some deaths are mourned. The speaker of a refusal to mourn understands that the world is already withholding its grief from Brinsley. There is no human life there to mourn. To withhold mourning from all three, then, is to restore them to equal footing. And again, as Latinx readers, do we find this proposition unsettling. The second way that Latinidad impinges on a refusal to mourn is in the poem's recourse to the 1992 LA uprising. The sixth sonnet in the cycle, for example, revisits the television news footage of a black man celebrating after beating uh, Reginald Denny. Uh, if, you are, if you remember, if you're familiar with this news coverage. The speaker records, we watched in shock, the fury sure, but more so that it took this long to set it, all these matchstick years. The matchstick years uh, recall the one good match that lights the fire of the rebellion. But his witness of this spectacle in 1992 is ambivalent. If the speaker understands the pent-up fury that the violence has released, he also understands how this image will prop up racist caricatures of black men, how the looped image of a single black man on the nightly news will, in his words, prove us all, I think, one thug. The 1992 uprising has become synonymous with black resentment and outrage, and in this way it serves the poem well. But historians and demographers have noted that the South Central LA neighborhood where the uprising was fiercest were and are majority Latino. And that over a third of the individuals arrested in connection with the violence of the uprising were Latinx. The response of Latinx studies scholars to this fact typifies some of the limits of Latinidad that I um, uh, was gesturing at earlier in my talk. So here, for example, is Armando Navarro's influential um, uh, article about, uh, or a, a quote from his influential article about the uprisings. Though the media initially portrayed the eruption of discontent as one involving primarily African Americans and Koreans, the reality was that it was the first multi-ethnic eruption in the nation's history, 
In particular, Latinos became both protagonists and victims of the explosion. This is a, a familiar rhetorical move in Latinx studies to critique representations of black-white racial formation as reductive. What about us, right? But in relation to a refusal to mourn, such a critique seems implausible, since it would require us to believe either that Murillo doesn't know that Mexicans and Central Americans live in LA, which I don't think that's likely, <laughs> right? Or that he wants to minimize or cover over their particip participation. So I began by arguing that reading A Refusal to Mourn offers a different way of thinking about Latinx black poetics. And I wanna be clear again that my intent here is not to critique or subvert um, the uh, important presence uh, or the important work of scholars who are asserting the presence and contribution of Afro-Latinos uh, within Latino communities. That work is absolutely vital. And I believe that Murillo's poetry complements that work by reminding us that in addition to erasing the blackness from Latinidad, we have too often ignored the desires, needs, suffering, and joys of black people who li live alongside us as neighbors and friends uh, in our communities in the United States. We must defer our desire to always be the main character, the protagonists, as Navarro says, of the US racial story. So we might take the proximity of Dolores maybe and a refusal to mourn within the pages of contemporary American poetry as a representation of that proximity in the world and think of John Murillo as I do, uh, not primarily as an Afro-Latinx poet, but as a black and Latinx, a black and Mexican poet. The one is not enfolded into the other. That doesn't mean they bear no relation. We need to remember how we are always in proximity, always neighbors, always witnessing, and too often complicit in the violence done to each other. And we must stand up in solidarity and learn to mourn with those that mourn and refuse with those that refuse. Thank you. We have time for about 10 minutes of questions. Who would like to get us started? Thank you both for your papers. Um, I would love to hear you both in conversation about the question of, on one hand, lamentation, um, grief and mourning, and on the other hand, um, your contention around um, a refusal to mourn. I would just love to be in the room where it happens, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um I guess I'll, I'll start by saying that um, th this comes from a longer sort of thought process of what lamentation is. Um, it actually began in an essay published in like a religious studies journal called Killing the Buddha um, about why kept, you know, as, as essentially asking why as somebody who identifies as an atheist, do I consistently read the biblical books of lamentations and Habakkuk, and in particular during moments of racial violence? Every single time I saw something on TV, I ended up with a Bible in my lap. I was like, what is Lamentation? So in those two books, Lamentation is extraordinarily angry. It's not mourning, but it kind of is. And it's essentially the declaration that we have fucked things up so much that we're never gonna get it back again. And essentially, good riddance. It's a declaration that we have broken everything that we've, we were given. So what's next is next. So I think what I'm trying to think of is lamentation not as even mourning, but as a really angry resolve to bear witness, to hold things up. So I, that's, that's my thought process there. Um, but yeah, also just, it does mourn too, actually, doesn't it? I'm gonna take off my mask so my voice isn't muffled. Um, so, I think for, uh, I, I really appreciated having um, these two papers be in conversation. And Francisco, I've read your essay on Lamentations, and I've also read your essay from in Post 45, where you take Lamentations and, and talk about it in relation to um, uh, Murillo's poetry also. And uh, I, I agree that I think that there's an important distinction to be made there. And I hope I, I was, I was 
I wanted to make that distinction as well that mourning and grieving and lamenting we kind of lump all of these things together um, mm. and uh, and in in you know in many ways those are all synonymous words I think in sort of colloquial usage right but for me what what's so powerful about um, a refusal to mourn is that it points at how our rituals around mourning, our practices of grief, the way we express ourselves, that they fit themselves into patterns and scripts that can reproduce violence, that can reproduce um, alienation, and in this really kind of perverse and paradoxical way, they undo, you, you can have mourning that undoes the work of grief, right, because it's so, uh, the rituals of mourning become so familiar that they don't actually allow us to uh, work through the trauma that the mourning is trying to commemorate. Um, and so um, I'll confess that I chose the poem that was most difficult for me <laughs> to encounter in Murillo's book. Like that poem, the first time I read it, it really upset me. And that's what I knew. That's what I knew that I had to um, try to work with it. And it's it's right around that that um, tension between mourning and grief where I, I found um, that I was having uh, having the most difficulty. Um, so um, and yeah. So I, I really appreciate like thinking about that in relation to lamentation and appreciate the question. And if you can't tell, it makes me so nervous to talk about Murillo's poetry with him in the room. <laughs> Um, so thank you, thank you. Um, I'm also like now nervous to hear someone talk about my work. <laughs> Actually, I think it's a, it's an interesting feeling for us as poets as well uh, to see her work interpreted in, interpreted in this way. Um, my question is around, you know, just talking about lamentation and mourning, um, and something that came up just in our regular conversation last night um, was about healing, mm -hmm. and I'm interested just in your thoughts about how their work addresses healing and in what ways does it heal, right? Or think about healing, um, because I think part of the grief process, right, is that eventually, you know, and we know healing, right, is, and grief is not linear by any means. Um, and so just thinking about your understanding of their work and what you read and where healing fits in. The good scholars were flipping through the books. Yep. <laughs> can, I, can, I, can I um, go first? Um, so um, one, th you know, maybe like one thing to say briefly is that I, um, uh, I think most of Murillo's poetry, most of the poems in these two books are not seeking to heal. Um, but that, um, that doesn't mean that the places where celebrations of black beauty, brilliance, and joy appear aren't healing. Um, but I think they're all the more valuable for being uh, rare within the collections. Um, and I, I especially see them in, um, there's two, um, um, there's, so the two poems that I, you know, if people, you know, I hope that, I hope everybody's like, oh, I need to buy these two books. Um, but if, if, the, if you want to look for those moments, um, you know, I would just point you at um, Flowers for Etheridge and Variation on a Theme by the Notorious uh, B.I.G., um, in the two books uh, as places where that, that kind of uh, celebration happens. But, you know, with, you know, with the caveat that I, I, I don't think that, that that's the main energy um, behind these two books. Actually, uh, just to briefly turn to uh, John's poetry as well, uh, upon hearing, hearing that Eric Dolphy transcribed even the, was it the calls of certain birds, is I think an extraordinary uh, way of thinking about this healing, partially because it, it has this image of birds crashing against the window, or one crashing against the window trying to get in, and it transforms that into two men fighting, and then, so it's, it's actually, it's a really extraordinary poem. It's just this long set of couplets that I would encourage you to read. It's on a Poetry Society's website, um, but also in Contemporary American Poetry, but uh, the poem I started with, uh, a poem with birds in it, you know, it has this really wonderful line, there's a cleaning the body does if you have a good healer. And actually, one of the things that I was super struck by, just because, you know, as I'm just telling you everything about my personal life. Um, as somebody who doesn't eat meat, I, I eat a lot of mushrooms. And the mycelium networks that Jesenia talks about, 
Mushrooms always appear, the fruiting bodies, that's what we call mushrooms. Yeah. They always appear to heal. And there's this really wonderful book that I don't know if uh, you've read it, but it's The Mushroom at the End of the World by Anna Lohenhaupt Singh. And it's about a specific type of mushroom that pretty much only comes up in deforestation, the matsutake mushroom. It only ever appears in destroyed environments. And it needs a very specific type of like coniferous destruction mixed with deciduous upsurging. It can only ever appear. And it's like the most one of the most expensive things you can buy. Like they sell for hundreds of dollars an ounce um, because they have this taste that um, in particular in Japan they describe as just being like unthinkably rich. If there's umami, this is umami. They're like, this is literally the platonic ideal of umami. But mushrooms always appear to heal, always. They always appear after destruction. They're on rotten things, on destroyed things, on things that are starting to fall apart. They're the things that help trees communicate to each other. And in fact, if a tree is dying, it will actually send its nutrients to another tree through mycelium networks. Fungi are extraordinary. And so just thinking about how often that, that just that imagery appears as like this very small like kernel through which you build so much, that to me is really an extraordinary uh, image of healing, I will say. Um, I think that was a long construed, but also just, just that, yeah. Notre Dame is where you find all of the vegetarian atheists. <laughs> Uh, thank, thanks to both of the scholars for the great presentation today. Um, you, uh, my question stems from John's presentation, but the, the both of you can feel free to respond. Um, John, at the beginning of your remarks, you mentioned that the term Afro-Latinx um, still centers, or maybe it's the practice, maybe it's the use of this term in the field still centers Latinidad in ways that can sometimes be uh, problematic. And you ended your presentation on John's work by referring to uh, black and Latino, black and Mexican. And I was wondering if you were proposing the ampersand as a remedy to the problems of the hyphen. That depends on what you think about it. <laughs> so uh, this is really new, but um, uh, as, I, as I, I am, I did want to suggest at the beginning that um, I, I don't want to exaggerate, I think, um, something essential to the term Afro-Latinx, um, but maybe a grammatical relationship that can reproduce a dynamic of subordination, and that I think, um, in the ways that, you know, I'm thinking about, for example, I'm the, I have an administrative role in in my department, and the ways that people um, pick up on certain critiques as, um, sort of opening the door to another version of administrative multiculturalism. So maybe I have a colleague who's heard, oh, now we need to be conscious of Afro-Latinidad, and that means a certain thing to them. And it, uh, um, or even within Latinx studies, right? Um, I, you know, I'm involved in several organizations, right? Now we need to have a special issue or, or this or that, right? And that always seems to me to reproduce a dynamic of this is Latin, Latinx studies work and now we're going to make room for another part of it, right? Uh, or a, you know, a, a smaller subordinate but contributing part of it. And so that's the that's the the kind of logic that I'm trying to resist. I don't want to suggest that it's it's endemic or essential to that term, but I was trying to think: Is there another way to articulate a relationship? And so uh, I and that's a very this was a very late actually. I was, I was on a run um, on Saturday and I was like, what would I say? Like, what would, how would I put it, right? And I had been thinking about, if you, uh, earlier in the talk actually, I used Latinx black poetics, I just flipped it. Um, and then I tried to think, well, what if, uh, as, um, as you put it better than I did, right? What if uh, we made it a cumulative um, La uh, Mexican and black or Latinx and black and um, allowed the conjunction with the ampersand um, to do a different kind of work. 
Um, and I'll say that that's an experiment, and I would love to, you know, I would love to hear what you what you think about it, or what others think about it. But um, it, it's very kind of provisional, um, a provisional gesture. One final question. Okay. I just I wanted to pick up on that. Thank you for that question, Darello. Um And I am. I took pause actually listening um, to your talk and to the kind of um, because there's a certain violence that Latinx and or the the deployment of Latino as a particular like mestizo imagination right and the ways that it gets taken up both in popular culture and in everyday practices etc. But there is no Latino Latinx without blackness right it's an essential component to Latino identity. So then. Um, I'm just trying to sit with the kind of, um, you know, it is Mexican and black as if Mexican is not already black, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and um, then that, that and then just re-signifies a kind of extraction of blackness from Mexicanness or from Puerto Ricanness or from whatever, right? From Chicanoness, as if Chicanoness is not already always black, that what is missing is recognition of or the, the political consciousness around that. Um, so in that way, um, I just, I just, uh, I was wondering if, if you wanted to say a little bit more about that. I don't want to put you on the hot seat either, though. You know what I'm saying, my brother? So, no. um, the, the but, only thing I would, the only thing I would say about that is, uh, you're right, and thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think you're you're absolutely right about that. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, um, as I, you know, as I said, like I'm trying to experiment. I'm trying to find. I'm trying to find a language, but. Um, you know, um, as as in any any journey, right? Like I'm stumbling towards st stumbling towards something, um, and uh, so I, I appreciate I appreciate the questions and and the feedback, and I hope that I can um, get towards articulating um, articulating something in a way that'll be generative. Yeah. So I appreciate it. To that end, sorry. Um, to that end, the kind of um, examination of the poem as being a black poem and not Latino poem. Um, then I think part of what could be quite radical in the reading of it is saying that this like black poem is a Latino poem, right? Because this, these experiences are coming and rooted up together. And that whether the scene itself is New York City and police violence there, or if it's Colombia and police violence there, or Mexico or Brazil and police violence there, right? Like in any kind of context, these things are intertwined, right? Um, through modernity and its violences and the experiences of black people diasporically so that it's not a black poem stop by a Latino, right? But that the fact that black Latinos like me exist and we're writing and reflecting on the world and, and it might be in English and it might be about what's happening on the street, you know, on 14th Street or whatever the case may be or here in South Bend, or, right? So I think there is really cool potential there. And I think we need to end there. Thank you. <laughs>